You know, it's fun too. The um, when you kind of when the book comes out, one of the you know the exciting things is being able to get to go on the road and, and share the story with lots of people that, that you don't get to know very well. But the, the my favorite part is always to do kind of like the friends and family events in town because um, San Francisco has such a wonderful literary community, uh, and I'm so thankful that you guys came out tonight to share this with me. I know it can be tough to rally get out of the house after you get out of the cubicle. Um, I really appreciate you coming by. Um, do you want to do a, a little Q&A and talk about the book? Do you have any, any questions? Yes? How long did it take you from start to finish to write the masters, as, a pair, as opposed to like your other books? I started pieces of this book um, before I was even went to grad school. It's so back in um, 0102. I had a short story, but with no eyebrows and shambles and kind of running the, the, the narrative thread. And I also wrote a story um, right after my father died um, about having the opportunity to, to dress his dead body. He was naked when, when hospice came, and as a kind of like a ritual to say goodbye, they said, you know, would you like to, to put clothes on him? It's kind of like a final ritual. Um, so we took advantage of that, and I tried to write about it for years and years, and I could never get the tone right. It would come out, you know, too maudlin or two other words I don't know, but it was like, like I wasn't able to do it. Um, and it was funny, it actually, the moment didn't work until I edited myself out of the story. Um, and I realized that it was more to be a moment between husband and wife. And I excised myself from that moment, that was when it really started to sing. It's kind of an interesting com topic too, because then you think, well is that, is that still a memoir? It's my, it's my memory, but I'm not on stage in that particular moment, so is that creative nonfiction or is, is that fiction? Kind of one of the fun ways we get to, to blur those lines or take our own life experiences and twist them until they, they work in the wild like that. This one I think took a lot longer too because of its omniscience. My first two books were first person, which I think is, at least for me, is a little bit easier to write in. It took me a lot longer to understand what all the, how all these different people think. You have to like peek into their hearts, you know, peek into their minds, understand how they're problem solving works and whatnot. And then that took me a long time to get it right. But it was also for the most fun I've ever had on the page. All you writers out there, if you've ever if you haven't played around in third omniscient, like I can't recommend it any higher. Like, it was super fun. And I'm gonna write I'm sorry, I'm gonna write my same book the same way next time. because um, it was like the most fun I've ever had on the page for sure. Yeah man. Uh, two questions. One is, why Damascus? Some kind of Syrian tie-in or something. And then, uh, what is there a real bar on the mission that this was based off? It's kind of yeah. 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 Can we go now? I mean, <laughs> I think most literally it's based on a, a place called Shotwell that used to be a 20th sure. in Folsom. Yeah. My friend Mike Shelton used to own it. He was, like, was such a boy that he went to like Home Depot and I like, got this super great deal on forest green paint. <laughs> so he was just like, fuck it. I'm gonna paint the floor, I'm gonna paint the ceiling, and the whole bar was green, it was crazy. <laughs> um, and when I tried to put it on the page, it didn't work as green, but when I changed it to black, it actually made a pretty good metaphor for what's going on for, for these particular characters. You, you meet this bar in my first book, Some Things That Meant the World to Me. That's the first scene of that book, the, the main character, Rhonda, is sitting in Damascus. So I knew I wanted to keep playing with that world, but I also knew I wanted it to be just a little bit different, so I added those smashed mirrors on the ceiling to give it a little bit of its own feel. I mean, I think you could certainly read into it, the, you know, On the Road to Change, you know, the, the Saul to Paul, the Paul to Saul riff. Um, for me, I think it, it just stands as more of like a microcosm. Like I wanted to play around with these like four, five, six bar flies. Um, I wanted to find a way to talk about, not about archetypes, but about these like five people that like I really truly care about. And sadly, these are the people that I've spent the most time with for like the last five years. And it's funny how your imaginary friends become these really vital <laughs> voices. I think that's called schizophrenia. <laughs> think about it, but I mean, it's, it's really what we do. So I think that having that really true and really sincere affection is a really important part of what we do on the page. Probably Mission Bar, is that what you were thinking was Damascus? <laughs> Benders? There's a lot of good options. Yeah. <laughs> Tony, what would you think would have been the best Mission District reference point? I don't drink. <laughs> no, I uh, totally <laughs> forgot that. <laughs> I thought I was, yeah, I was thinking maybe Mission Bar. I was trying to think of um, Attic. 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I was thinking of that. There's some matter. Yeah. Phone yeah. booth. It's a good one. No. Yeah, Charles. Yeah, uh, you kind of answered this one by implication, perhaps. But when I was reading it, um, I was really, really struck by the images. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering whether you started with the story or the image. Like in my imagination, yeah. I thought of you as thinking, wow, a bartender that wears a Santa Claus suit all the time. Right. And then going back from that, and sure. saying, well, how do I get this guy into a Santa Claus suit? Right. Or the same thing with the fishes or the two men, middle-aged mm -hmm. men sleeping on pool tables. Yeah. So did you, s in the case, you did say that in the case of the dressing the courts, you started with an image right. and built the story from that. Is that true for much of the book? Well, I think there's always going to be a lot of reverse engineering and kind of putting a novel together. Like, uh, there's that Grady and Forster quote, you know, like, how do I know what I think till I see what I say? Yeah. But you kind of get the rough draft down and you're like, so much of it is subconscious or that kind of embracing that process of exploration and discovery. Then you see like what's good and you try to build around that and all you mostly it's terrible and try to like get rid of all that and build around the good stuff. But I never write with any sort of schematic. Uh, I really I really dig those kind of on the fly um, discoveries. So I always know what chapter one's going to be, and then I never want to know what's coming after that. Um, it puts a weird onus on the revision process because it means I'm going to take more wrong turns along the way than somebody who has a you know, very fastidiously plans out an outline or whatever. Um, but I really like the mess. I remember hearing this quote from Tom Waits where he said that he likes to listen to music in a different room than w where the speakers are because he hears it wrong. And I, I think that's a really interesting idea, like embracing the, the sloppy elements of storytelling. I think often when, when art starts to feel stilted or predictable is when we work too hard to make it symmetrical. You know, real easy causality, you know, this happened and this happened, and maybe it maps up too nicely. Real life's a little shaggier than that, and I, I try to make my books shaggy like that, too. Yeah. With that said, would you say when starting this book, did you know the ending? I knew that eventually I was going to try to work that dressing of the dead body in there. Um, but I didn't have any idea how I was going to get there. I mean, there was a lot of, the first draft of this book was almost 600 pages. Wow. Which is, for me is really weird because my books tend to be really like skinny. Some would say malnourished. Some would say lean. <laughs> I don't know. It depends who you're asking, right? Um, but this one took a lot of like concision and expansion. You know, blow it up, try to learn as much as I can, and take out all the stuff that, that I had to know in order to write the book, but that a reader would find tedious or boring. And we've all had that experience, right? And it's usually in the middle of a book. You're flipping pages and your attention's like, I'm going to go do anything else except <laughs> read what's going on in the page right now. Sometimes I wonder if that's when the writer hasn't taken out all the stuff that should have just gone into their research folder, hit the cutting room floor. So you said um, you sort of addressed this already, but your first two books you kind of have talked about how you wanted them to have the velocity of like extended short stories. Yeah, yeah. So was this one different? Yeah, this one's paced a lot differently. I think you probably are get 60 pages into the book before you really even know where the danger is coming from. It's such a big cast that I actually didn't think about it. I don't even know if this makes sense to anybody so in my tiny mind. But like, I didn't think about it as being kind of chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, so on and so forth. But I thought about writing a chapter ones for each of those characters. Because I wanted to make sure to give them all kind of this like stunning first impression. So even though it would, it would be chapter five to the reader, I really wanted to find this like eloquent way to introduce the reader to this other person who's going to be, you know, really imperative to the story that's to come. And then once we have the whole cast on the stage, then all hell breaks loose from there. But the, the first two books are only dealing with a handful of players, so I can kind of sidestep a lot of that stuff and just throw you into the chaos and hope it all works out by the last page. And this one I had to lay a little bit more groundwork. It was really fun. It was really, really cool. These, these were um, normally about halfway through is when I, I, I hate it. I think all writers have this moment where you're so used to your own plot. You think everything seems predictable, everything seems trite. All the characters seem flat and obvious because you know them so well, there's no surprise left. And it didn't really happen with this group in the same way. They kept revealing uh, new things about themselves. I mean, it's kind of like actually like making a real friend in that sense. You build a certain level of trust, and then they say, 
oh yeah, I did this terrible thing when I was 15, I've never told anybody else about this before. You know, I betrayed this person that, that really, really mattered to me. But you have to earn that certain level of respect before they're going to whisper in your ear in that fashion. Yeah? Did you think about that phrase, all roads lead to Damascus? I mean, it was certainly in the, in the back of my head. I don't know if I was ever conscious of that. But I, I, I mean, I know the, the story for sure. But my father was a minister, so I'm relatively <laughs> steeped in my Bible. Yeah. Could you come out to I, I don't, That's interesting. I don't know yeah. if I can. You need to explain this. You just got this for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> I wish I had a better answer. About that. I, don't know I just keep thinking of those animals in the whale. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They all got wrangled today, right? Yeah, they're all sure. Murdered, wrangled. Yeah. <laughs> Carol? Um, were any characters uh, more fun for you to write or more difficult for you to write? Yeah, it's funny too because I, I never really know like who's going to demand a lot of stage time. Like until I kind of see who's charismatic on the page, I may be like, oh, this person's going to be super important. And then I get in the scene and they just like lie there big and stupid and aren't doing anything fun. And then this person that I think is just going to have a cameo or just be kind of a supporting player, you know, she gets up there and, you know, she's got that sizzle and she's really fun to spend time with. So then when I go back, I'm going to make sure to build around her and get rid of the, the stupid guy as much as I can. Um, you know, th I think the, the character that, the cancer patient resonated a lot to me, because like I said, some of this was kind of a love letter to my dad, who died of stage four lung cancer too. So that was in the back of my head. And then there's this young, kind of silly punk rocker, that like, I had, was having a lot of fun, not always with him, but sometimes a little bit at, at his expense. Um, he was really, just a riot to do. Yeah. yeah. I'm one, I think you told me that you wrote this book not in one document, that you took each chapter and made a separate document and yeah. didn't, I meant to ask, I think, did you go back and reread them when you started a new one, or was it, that was kind of the point, was not to do that, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I probably cheated more than I was yeah. intending to. I mean, the whole idea was I would just take what I'd learned in this previous draft, not even use it as a frame of reference, and just kind of plug in and go and see what happens. I, I mean, I from a process standpoint, I develop certain habits and certain tips, and it's kind of like, I think we do the best art when we get out of our comfort zone. We're like, maybe, you know, I'm really happy doing it this way, but what happens if I don't allow myself to do it that way? Just to kind of challenge myself. But I mean, I was never gonna cut stuff that was good. You know, so if I wrote a chapter that I really liked over here, why would I rewrite it if, if that one's already kind of got the sizzle, you know? Sure. Anybody else? Should we go have a drink over at the Suvio? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it seems to me that, you know, like, the best art for, for, for any medium is it, drawn from personal experience. You know, if you don't have some kind of, like, thread into the, the subject that you're, you're, you're approaching, then you don't really have any ground to make it realistic, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's art or, you know, writing or music or, or painting or whatever. So it, it really just makes me wonder, is, is there like a shambles, Leota, like <laughs> devastating hand job, like connection going on here? Is it like, you know, like come around like a or that? I will, I'll say this. That, I mean, I think a lot of this, I mean, I wrote this book getting off of drugs and booze. And so that was like a big part of this process for me was like, there's a ton of optimism in this book that that take question seriously? No. There, um, <laughs> there was no optimism in those first two narratives really. Like they're very nihilistic or very fatalistic. And this one's kind of got this like hopefully anyways, if I did my job right, it's got this big beautiful heart running through it that, that wasn't in the first two books because I wasn't able to really access that side of myself. So hopefully it informs the story in a much more interesting way. <laughs>